Well, here we are, episode six, rereading Philemon. Last time I asked you to look for repetition in this short book, and uh, let's see what the results are. Welcome to the Bible Journeys podcast. Your traveling companion is Ed Dickerson, an author, teacher, and scholar. He holds a master's degree in religious education from Andrews University. As you explore together, you will learn tools and techniques that illuminate scripture, renew your faith, and brighten your journey. So here we are, rereading Philemon, episode six, rereading it as it was meant to be read. By Because we are so far separated in time and culture from Philemon, we need to reread it and to ask questions and do things so that we can truly understand what was meant in the first place, because that's the controlling meaning. It isn't just whatever I think it means today, but what did Paul intend to be telling Philemon? And what did he intend Philemon to understand? That's the question we want to get at first. And as we do that, then we can understand not only what they believed at the time, we can also understand what it is and what it means for today and how we should apply that to our own lives. Of course, this whole thing can be daunting, but don't forget, the Bible was not written for the scholar alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. This quotation by Ellen White, 19th century uh, devotional writer. And that really is, is an important thing to understand. It was written for common people. Philemon wasn't a scholar. He was uh, probably a businessman of some sort. He, had, he was very well-to-do. He owned, not only did he own at least one slave, but he had the master force. There's lots of things going on there. So we need to understand that. And of course, I keep telling you this, learning the Bible as it was meant to be read may be daunting at times, but do not lose heart. Whoever you are, the Bible was written for you. It wasn't written to you. The epistle of Philemon, uh, Philemon was written to Philemon. But it was written for us. It has been preserved for us. And this is not new to read and reread and to, to interpret, to understand this. In, in Nehemiah's day, when they were restoring the temple, Nehemiah 8.8 8 says, They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people understood what was being read. By the time of Nehemiah, parts of the Bible were centuries old and were written to a different situation. And so they had to read it in a way that would be understood by the people of that time, around the 5th or 6th century BC, when there has been the restoration. They're going back and rebuilding the temple. Uh, Mortimer Adler, we've talked about this already, but it's important to remember, he's, he's really understood this and, and explained it very well. When we read for information, we require facts. When we read to understand, we learn not only facts, but their significance, and that's what we need to do. Now, last time I gave you uh, an assignment, and I talked about various things, words, repetition of words, themes, circumstances, and um, the, the, even puns. And I'm going to start you out with the puns. Onesimus means productive or useful. And that pun comes up in this text uh, very in a very pointed way. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister. This is about the term brother. Brother is repeated, brother or sister is repeated five times in 25 verses. It's one of the most common terms here. And the entire epistle of Philemon is going to be emphasizing this close familial relationship that, that Paul is, uh, Timothy is Paul's brother, and Philemon is also a beloved brother, and to Aphia, our sister, I assume, uh, don't know for sure, but probably Aphia is Philemon's wife. So there we have it. Um... You note that, you know that Timothy is a brother, as is Philemon, and Aphia is a sister, whereas the others are fellow workers 
or fellow soldiers. So he's making a very specific appeal to Philemon with this use of brother. And that's going to come out in uh, later in the book where we see, uh, for I, this is verse 7, For I've had great joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. And he's saying this, that the, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed. Paul has received joy and comfort because uh, Philemon is generous and, and takes care of the saints. It's they, the saints have been refreshed through him. And that's one of the things that Paul says makes us brothers. We're doing these things. And I, I, am, uh, I rejoice because you have helped them. That makes me feel good. And then in 16, when he gets in the middle of the appeal, he says this, that you can receive Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so he's all this, this entire uh, epistle is going to be an appeal. That's the central part. And it is appeal on the basis of this close relationship. And it's really amazing because uh, slaves were, were not considered uh, brothers. Uh, slaves were, you know, lesser, lesser beings in many cases. And so here we have him saying, not only do I want you to forgive him, I want you to receive him as a brother. And we'll see even he as as he would receive Paul himself, because Paul has emphasized, we are brothers. And uh, Philemon, you're my brother. Onesimus is our brother. And this is a remarkable and revolutionary thing in the first century, that a slave could be a brother. So that's the, that's the first part. Brother and sister shows up in verses 1. It shows up twice in verse 2. shows up in verse 7 and in verse 16. So that's, again, five times in 25 verses. This is a very compact uh, little letter. And then there is the repetition of the word prisoner and the idea, the concept of imprisonment. In verse 1, Paul says uh, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I, you know, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, he begins the letter with that. Um, and now in, when he begins the appeal, uh, roughly in, in uh, verse 9, Yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Verse 10, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I fathered in my imprisonment. So he is claiming that Onesimus is his spiritual son and that this occurred during his imprisonment. Fascinating situation. Uh, in other places, uh, Timothy is referred to as Paul's son, his spiritual son. So this is a very, very special relationship. Paul is telling Philemon that this slave that ran away from you is is very close to me. In fact, he's going to say, he's my very heart. We'll get to that in a minute. And then at the very end, where he's listing the other people who are with him and who also send their greetings, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. So Philemon is not only a free man, he is a wealthy man, he is a slave owner. And Paul is a person who is imprisoned locked up, does not have the uh, the opportunity to move about as he wills. And so he's contrasting, Paul is contrasting his situation with that of Philemon, and in the same way contrasting Onesimus with uh, Philemon. And Paul is very much identifying with Onesimus. Onesimus is a slave. I'm a prisoner. And so Yet we can be brothers. That's very central to the, the entire uh, meaning of this. Um, and then there's the idea of debt. 
And this is really touching when we get to this. Really touching because this idea of debt, uh, owing something, there's an obligation. And Paul wants to make this clear, this, this relationship. And so this occurs repeatedly. So he says of Onesimus, uh, to Philemon of Onesimus, if you then regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. Now, this is startling. This is one of those occasions in Scripture where a leader, of one of God's leaders, and a mere human being acts in a very mo in a most Christ-like manner. One is where Moses, uh, when when God says, "You know, I've, I've had it with these people. They're stiff-necked. They're not. They they, they they disobey me. I'm going to wipe them out. And I'll make a nation of you." He says to Moses, and Moses says, "Oh no, 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 no! If if you're not going to accept them, wipe me out." He's taking the role of Christ. Uh, bearing their responsibility and willing to take their penalty. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying, uh, you know, regard me, regard Onesimus the same way you would regard me. Now, Onesimus, we know, we mentioned this last time, has escaped. He has run away. He is worthy of death in Roman law. Uh, Philemon would, no one would blink an eye. If Philemon had Onesimus killed, that is to say, of the regular society, the Christians obviously and Paul are of a different situation. But as far as civil society is concerned, um, Philemon wants to kill Onesimus. That's his right, especially since Onesimus stole something which it, from him, which is himself. That is, Onesimus and his services were taken from uh Philemon and, and Philemon has every right to to kill him if he chooses. So Paul is saying, you know, accept him as you would me. And he's already stressed and, and it will stress several times in this letter that that he has had a relationship with Philemon that has helped Philemon find the Lord. And so he's saying he may be an escaped slave and guilty of death. And I may be your mentor. I am certainly your brother. But now accept us both in the same light. See us both in the same light. If you regard me as a partner, accept him, Onesimus, as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way, here comes the old business of debt and, and, uh, and owing and obligation. If he has wronged you in any way, now Paul knows that he has. This isn't really a question, but he's making this point very clear. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Again, this is the, the Christ-like thing. Our sins were charged to Christ's account. And so Paul is taking the same position with Anastomus in regard to Philemon. Yeah, he's he's run away from you. You have the right to kill him, but if you need to, if you need to take someone's life, take mine. Onesimus is precious to me. He's our brother. He's your brother. He's my brother. He's a beloved brother. This again is is it just rocks the the ancient world, and for people today who say that the Bible endorses slavery, they only read parts of it, and this is something we'll talk about in future podcasts, which is. This is what I consider two-dimensional uh, Bible study to say, well, the, the Bible um, endorses slavery because you can't see anywhere where it says that they should uh, you know, not have slaves. Well, that's only partially true to begin with, but beyond that, it does not look at the reality of the context, the situation in life, as it's called, the German term that used the theologians is sitz im Leben, the situation in life. Uh, God understands that human beings only could take so much change at a time. In fact, he, he tells in the Gospel of John, he says, I have more to tell you, but you cannot bear it. And we are all that way. God has more to reveal to us, but we cannot necessarily bear it. And that's important to understand. 
one of the great preachers of the, just before the Enlightenment, um, said that do not do not ask God to to show you all your sins. He said that he did it, and, and for two years he couldn't preach at all. He was overwhelmed with with uh, seeing the sins that he did, and I'm sure that God probably didn't reveal all of them even then. You know, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that we're not even aware of many of the sins we commit. So, if he has wronged you in any way, if he owes you anything, charge that to my account. And then Paul says this, I, Paul, have written this with my own hand. I will repay it. And then the parentheses says, not to mention that to you, that you owe to me even your own self as well. He's saying, you owe me a lot more. But I will repay whatever losses you want to recover as the result of the activities of Onesimus, our beloved brother. I will personally repay that. And I cannot say for sure. I've done some research on this. I think it's likely. When Paul says, I have written this with my own hand, this is in fact a contract. It's enforceable. If in law, Philemon wanted to make a claim against Paul and, and his, his estate, if you will, or his, any wealth, anything that he possesses, then Paul is saying, I'll repay it. And this is an enforceable document. I believe that to be true. That's the whole point. It's like I'm signing this. I'm writing with my own hand. I will repay it. Does he believe that Philemon is going to require him to do that? No. Which he says later, I'm confident you'll do even more than I ask as he closes the letter. We, again, if we've done the pre-reading, we already know that. But what he's saying here is I want you to know I'm serious. I am dead serious. I'm not just using a uh, rhetorical flourish here. I'm not just trying to convince you. I mean this. This Onesimus matters so much to me that I'll pay whatever it takes for him to be regarded as a brother by you, for him to be accepted by you. And then he says, yes, brother, let me benefit from you. That's not exactly uh, obligation or debt, but it is, it's related here. You know, I'll pay with my own. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Now, remember, he's already said that the, the believers, the saints, are refreshed because of Philemon's generosity and Philemon's faith and his love. And so here he's saying, okay, do for me what you do for others. And do for, you know, receive Onesimus. Uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. And it's even more amazing when you think about the fact that he almost certainly sent this letter with Onesimus. Onesimus is carrying this letter back because he, he says, I'm sending him to you. Carrying this letter physically back to Philemon. And Philemon, I mean, it could be, you know, he, he could, it could be a death sentence. He could be, he could kill him. That's why Paul is being so earnest about this. I don't care how much you feel you've been uh, burned. I will pay it back. How much you've lost at this, how upset you may be. Receive him as you would receive me. Pretend it's me. Think of it as me when Onesimus comes. And he brings this with you, with him. Just by looking at repetition. That's all we did right now. Just by looking at repetition, we see the theme, the theme and the words of brotherhood and sisterhood. We see the puns on uh, useless and useful. And we see the debt and obligation and, and imprisonment and enslavement. These parallels are there. Just by looking at that simple thing. We can get this much uh, out of the letter of Philemon.
Now, we're not going to spend a lot more time on Philemon right now. We're not going to go through every possible step we could. I don't want you to become discouraged and overwhelmed by this because uh, it's important. We'll see that in a minute. That this, uh, When you're doing it for the first time, I mentioned this, it's like driving a manual transmission. The first time you do it, you know, it's it's very complicated just to shift one time. But once you get used to it, you make long journeys through traffic and all kinds of conditions up and down mountainsides, and you shift up and down without even thinking about it. It becomes part of your habit. The same thing can happen with Bible study. You just get used to doing it for the first time. Another example would be, uh, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but certainly it's happened to me many times where I'll be driving from home to work or to church or to someplace I go on a com- on an everyday basis or a regular basis. And uh, when I get there, I don't remember even having passed through certain places or, or making certain turns I because I've been thinking about other things as I've been doing it. But the point is, uh, and where I live, I live in the country, uh, it's a fairly complicated uh, route to get to uh, either of the larger cities near me. I mean, there are multiple turns and, and uh, things you have to look for. Uh, but, you know, I, I can do it on autopilot on a regular basis. And the same thing can happen with Scripture. Once you get used to the, the idea and you get used to implementing these procedures on a regular basis, then it's not, I wouldn't say it's easy, but as uh, uh, John Charity said about poetry, it's not, it's not easy, it's joyously difficult. And there are a lot of things like that in life, aren't there? We love to engage in it, we love to accomplish it. So, that, but that's just, I'm just showing you that this is all it takes. We're just looking at repetition. If you start looking at repetition in Limited passages. You know, I mean, yes, you can do it for a whole book, for the Gospel of Mark, for example. That's the shortest gospel. You can do it, but that takes quite a while. I mean, I don't want you to become discouraged. But even in a, in a chapter or two or an episode or two that takes place in Scripture, if you note repetition alone, these simple things, you will discover new meaning in Scripture. All right. And here are the puns that I mentioned earlier. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I fathered in my imprisonment, who was previously useless to you, but now is useful to both you and me. So he was useless to you alone. Now he's useful to both of us. I've sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart. This is the most strenuous of appeals. So now looking again, reading Philemon as it was meant to be read. Remember, Philemon is a letter. An epistle is a letter. And it begins with, just looking at the structure of this now, it begins with a standard salutation from, to, in the order, an affirmation of the recipient. The body is an appeal, the appeal for Onesimus, and there's a close where he affirms the recipients again. And he sends greetings from others who are with him, as he began with uh, sending from him and and from Timothy. And then he ends with a blessing. And I'm going to, there's about 500 words, roughly 500 words in the English translation. It depends on the translation and so forth. And I'm not talking here about the Greek, but roughly 500 words. Because another way we can look at this, we want to see how it's structured. We talked about this last week somewhat. This is how it's structured, and this is the size of it. It's only about 500 words, which for those of you who are as old as I am, it's about two double-spaced pages of typewritten material. Just about 500 words. And the appeal takes up almost 230 of those words. So, that tells you something. The appeal is the bulk of this. It's almost half of all the words is the appeal. The purpose of this letter is to make an appeal to Philemon on the basis of Onesimus, his escaped slave. And he does this, as we've seen, by making the the point about brotherhood. 
And so we want to read the appeal one more time just to get a good feel for it. Here's the appeal. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I fathered in my imprisonment, who previously was useless to you, but now is useful to both you and to me. I've sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart, whom I wanted to keep with me so that on your behalf, he might be at my service in my imprisonment for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps it was for this reason that he was separated from you for a while, that he, that you would have him back forever. This is eternity. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge this to my account. I, Paul, have written this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention that to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. And again, looking at these, the uh, structure, begins the salutation from and to in that order. Affirmation of the recipient, appeal, affirmation of the recipient, and greetings from the others with Paul and ending with a blessing. Those of you who have studied with me before will notice that there's something about this structure which is familiar, but that's part of the more complicated study we'll do in a future podcast. Right now, just remember this. And remember this too for Mortimer Adler on how to read a book. While you're in the stage of learning to read, you have to go over a book more than once. If it is worth reading at all, it is worth three readings at least. Let me hasten to say, though, he says, that the expert reader can do these three readings at the same time. And that's true. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, I welcome them. Uh, you can send this to my email at biblejourneys at yahoo.com. If you're looking for supplementary materials, you can find those at www.patreon.com slash Bible Journeys. Let the Lord bless you. I hope that you find you can take this tool, simply looking at repetition, and discover the great treasures that have always been there that now you can make your own. If you've gained something from this discussion, please be sure to share it with someone, because those who join our Bible Journeys here can become our traveling companions for eternity.